It's remarkable to be here with a, I mean, you really did create not just a company, but an industry with the work you did in, in you. gene splicing. It's quite an accomplishment. And if I'm right, I mean, back in the 1970s when you started this company, it wasn't that common for people to make the leap from academia to private industry. This is very true. <laughs> uh, and uh, <clears throat> it uh, was quite an experience uh, after all these years to uh, have the opportunity to work in academic research and then also go into uh, a biotechnology business. But you had a notion from the beginning. I mean, this is a company, by the way, we talked about Cisco being on the 100 best places to work list for 20 years. You guys have been there for 19 years. That's pretty good. That's not shabby. You. <laughs> You had a strong notion at the beginning of the kind of workplace you wanted to create. Can you talk about that? How did you think about the company and the workplace you wanted to create? Can I tell a story? You can tell a story. John Chambers told about 27 in 30 minutes. So. <laughs> I like to start by saying it was a long, long time ago. <laughs> It wasn't that long ago. In a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> no, that was San Francisco. <laughs> well, it's some considered to be a different galaxy. <laughs> yeah. But in any case, um, I had had a rather uh, successful career at that time in academia doing research at the University of California and been fortunate enough to be involved in uh, the first uh, experiments developing the technology of uh, genetic engineering. And I got a call one day out of the blue from a young man in San Francisco I'd never met before. He told me his name was Bob Swanson and he asked me a pointed question. He said, do you think the technology that I've been reading about is ready to be commercialized. And I said, yes, I think it is. So we had a meeting and got together. And <clears throat> he was 29 years old at the time. I was 10 years his senior. He worked for a venture capital firm at the time, Kleiner Perkins become a well-known venture capital firm after that. And uh, he said he wanted to start a company and he was looking for some new technology. And I, said, I told him, yes, it's ready to go. So we got together and uh, we put together a business plan and we took it to Tom Perkins and the three of us put the company together and in case you don't recognize, that's me on. <laughs> that Herb, I, I think we've got it. We've got a picture. There we go. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, I knew that was you. <laughs> so in any case, uh, I've always thought that Bob and I were naive, and I think Tom Perkins was a little naive, although he would never admit that. <laughs> but. Uh, he didn't know what we were talking about, and this, this photo was actually taken in his office down in the Embarcadero Center. And we very simply outlined the technology for him, and he said, okay, it sounds good. And so he gave us enough money to uh, have an office uh, in which Bob occupied within their space. And our research was conducted at the University of California, City of Hope, and Caltech. We had three uh, contracts, one with my lab and the other two. We established a proof of concept uh, with that, and then we went on to put the company together. We had a business plan, what we wanted to do, uh, and we thought we had to create a great place to work. And we were naive, but 
we also had a clean slate. We were working from scratch. So we had a blank book in front of us. And Bob said, well, let's take the best of academia and the best of business and see if we can put them together. So we did. And it, at the very beginning, uh, I was concerned. I never told Bob how concerned I was about how we could attract young scientists to the company. Because this was a new idea, biotechnology. It wasn't even called biotechnology at the time. But I was concerned, and so I thought we really have to provide certain things for the scientists. So the culture started out trying to create an environment for scientists. And so first of all, we made sure they got a good salary. And secondly, we pointed out to all the candidates that we uh, met with that you will share the risk and you will share the reward. So we managed to set up some stock programs for people uh, joining us. And we gave the scientists the freedom to publish. I had a hard time with Bob on that. I, I was going to say, I would think anybody in business says, are you yeah. out of your yeah. mind? We want proprietary technology. Yes. We that, don't want you to publish what you that, find. That was a hard point to push, but I think it was probably the key for the success of the company. And the only uh, thing we insisted upon was that free to publish, but the patent lawyers had to be advised immediately when something publishable or potentially patentable uh, that had to be taken to the patent lawyer. So they didn't stop publication, they just made sure that you had filed your patent papers. Yes, and, and the, the freedom to publish for the scientists uh, led to their recognition within the scientific community with their peers, and they were able to go out and go to meetings, scientific meetings, make contacts, uh, recruit more people, which was a key. Yeah. Once this was out there, it's a great place to work. You can do science. You're going to make a name for yourself. And then we had another program that was a postdoctoral program. So it's a standard in academia where you bring in young scientists that just had their PhD and give them an opportunity to work. They would come work three years. It's a great melting pot for uh, ideas to bubble up out of. And um, so th that was good. And then, then the other uh, uh, point of the culture was to provide a sabbatical, which is standard academia. So that after wow. six years, uh, six years, six years of employment, uh, uh, everyone would get a six weeks sabbatical. Managua people would go off. Do what I like that. Do. How how many of you all have poli sabbatical policies like that? Show of hands. It was a great incentive, so and, uh, yeah. and and I'm, I'm taking mine next year. Okay. <laughs> I'll be tw 12 I'm years, ready. so it's my second sabbatical. I got a yeah, bunch of them back. You've got too much to do. Yeah. You, you know. <laughs> no, but, but, but people, so let's people, talk, people let's... who have been with Genentech a few years, well, that's, over that's time, a... will say, oh, yeah, I'm on my third sabbatical, or I'm on Amazing. my fourth sabbatical. You but, know, but, but that's what I, I really want to uh, talk about that, because you started this incredible company with, with this unique culture. Now it's very big. How many employees, Genentech employees today? In the U.S., 15,000. 15,000. So how do you translate that origin story into a company of 15,000, Bill? I that, mean, how do you scale that? that? That's a good question. I'll just say a few more words and turn it over to Bill. Um, that was always a concern. Um, but out of this initial culture, um, there was an evolution of the culture after that. So it was originally built for the scientists. And then it just, by osmosis, diffused into the whole organization. And I think people began to realize that they were appreciated as much 
as the scientists were, and the scientists appreciated everybody that worked in the organization, depended on them for their livelihood. It had to make a circle. And uh, it, 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 it evolved over the years to not just those facts that, that I talked about, but evolved to, I think, a culture uh, in which everyone felt that they were doing something meaningful. And when we first started having products, people would see how individuals with certain afflictions were being treated and helped. And they all thought, no, it's not that. This is something I've made a con to which I've made a contribution. And so it has evolved over the years. And uh, we were always concerned about how this culture would keep going as the company grew from a dozen to a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, and more. And this was a concern that the board had, and I served on the board from the day we created the company to when Roche bought us out. And we were always concerned, at least once a year, we'd have a, a session with our CEO at the time, Art Levinson. They, how can we keep the culture going? And Art said, we're trying to do the best we can. Well, they've done very well. And I think now that it, when I interact with groups, I was just with a, a group of marketing and salespeople in Las Vegas. They're kind enough to get me to come do something like this. And I, I must say, I'm just so impressed with what has been done since I left the company in 2009 as a board member. It's there and perhaps squared in a way. Hmm. It's still the enthusiasm that I remember from hmm. the early days. Well, so how do you pull that off? I mean, it's much easier when you're a smaller company and you really are changing the world. You're inventing a whole new technology, a whole new industry. 15,000, a lot of different things going on. Uh, people may not be di as directly connected to the results. What's the, what, how do you maintain that? Well, I think the most important ingredient is, is what Herb talked about, is this, is this sense of purpose and mission. And uh, I, I'm always surprised that so few companies seem to get this, that people don't actually get out of bed in the morning to be the number one company or to, to you know, grow earnings 10%. I mean, does anyone get excited about that? Like, wow, it's Monday. I, I'm so glad it's Monday. You know, we're gonna we're gonna grow earnings 10% this year. <laughs> it's it's just that's not exciting. I'm sorry. Uh, maybe maybe it's exciting for a few people, but most folks are not motivated that way. And I think having a clear connection to the mission, that everyone can see what their part is in it. And so, for example, you know, in in our business, we're about bringing breakthrough therapies to people with serious unmet needs, and we talk about that all the time. We talk about that way more than we talk about financials or, or you know, metrics or some sort of scorecard, uh, and we have posters around the campus. Of individuals. Of, of patients, and we bring patients in to town halls uh, and to talk about, hey, what's your experience been? Wow. And it's, it's constantly, Everyone is constantly reminded that is why we're here. They're saving lives. They're changing lives. Yeah. They, they see it yeah. every day. No, exactly. And, and I would say um, it's, not, it's, more, it's beyond communications. Communications is important. For example, if you, if you look at uh, major pharmaceutical companies and you look at their websites, they all have pictures of patients and they all talk about how they're helping patients. And that's great. Okay, but what was really interesting to me when I came to Genentech 11 years ago, running a, a, a piece of the business, the CEO at the time, he took me aside and he said, Bill, you're gonna have decisions you have to make where you're thinking, hmm, I could do something, but I'm not 100% sure it's absolutely the best thing for every patient. Um, but if you do it, it'll help you make your numbers. He said, when you have that choice, and you will have those choices frequently, I want you to miss your numbers. Wow. 
And, and for me, that's where, because, because well, I well, saw it from the outside. I'd heard about Genentech, this different kind of company, mission driven. But I always thought, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, that's, everyone talks about that. Everyone talks about how, well, we're here for society or we're here to do good. But when you're told, when you have those kind of choices, I want you to miss your well, numbers. Well, that's that, that makes it real. That's really interesting because, as you know, in your industry, we've seen some pretty dramatic examples in the last year or so of companies that have profit maximized, that have figured out that the you, you look at Valiant, you look at uh, uh, Martin Shkreli, uh, the, that they the, to maximize their number in a year, they can massively increase the price and the system will pay them yep. uh, uh, that price. I mean, how can you go back to Roche? You're now owned by a big company that has, to, you know, has market expectations. How can you go back to them and say, I'm not gonna maximize profits this year? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple parts to that answer. One, one part of the answer is that Roche is a 120 year old company that does have a very strong sense of social responsibility and so we actually have pretty, pretty sympathetic ears on that. Hmm. Um, but the other part is, it's, it's all part of what makes the company work. So our people are motivated to, to give their best work, to grow, uh, and to stay, by the way. We have much lower attrition than, than the pharmaceutical average. Uh, they're motivated because of the mission. But you can't say, we're, we're doing what's best for patients, except for on price. You know. And, and so we, we have a very clear pricing policy where we have, very, we have limits on, on price increases. We price our products lower than market expectations in each case. And um, that's part of the mission. You, you, can't, you can't talk it or live it in one part and then decide, oh, you're going to suspend that for some other part. And, and it's good for the business in the long term, if not in the next, necessarily in the next 12 months. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Did, did you worry about this precious culture you've created, did you worry in 2009 about turning it over to Roche? Yes. Uh, uh, Roche is Swiss, uh, and I yeah. tried to denigrate, but <laughs> the trains do run on time. <laughs> and, um, but we, we were concerned that it, it had a more a uh, stringent uh, business point of view, which turned out to be, they've, they've actually turned out to be uh, great partners over the year. And, uh, uh, but that, that was a concern. So uh, I might just add to what Bill said. Um, not only is it a sense of purpose, uh, but the employees exist, but they have fun. Yeah. Hmm. They really do. Um, and actually, you heard. I, I, we brought along a photo of that. I'm going to tee it up. Right. But but you, you and you and Bob set the tone on this. <laughs> with uh... <laughs> now, I think you're, I, I, Bill. I think you're going to have to provide some explanation. What in the world? I, I can't these, explain. This I is not Herb, the way I understand recombinant DNA. Uh, <laughs> what are they doing? I think Herb's going to have to explain this. Well. <laughs> I was the dumb one. I said Tweedledum <laughs> and Tweedledee. So we had uh, an early standing tradition uh, at the company to have what we called ho-hos. That was sort of a company-wide uh, celebration at the end of the week, whether or not you failed or succeeded. And it's a chance for everybody to get together, and there's stories that are unimaginable, but things happen. So one day, uh, when I was at the company, Bob said, uh, uh, come on in the office. I got to talk to you about the hoto on Friday, ho -ho on Friday. And I said, OK. And he said, uh, we're going to dress up as uh, Tweedledum and Tweedledee. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Well. Bob being boy, Bob being uh, Bob, uh, he, he had a great boyish sense of humor, and uh, he was a fraternity uh, guy, and so he liked the party. And he <laughs> the so um, he convinced me to do this. So we go off, and 
So we come out and they're playing music and we're dancing around and being crazy and everybody loved it. So those are the employees in the background. We held it in a warehouse uh, on campus and so on. So those, that, that culture evolved. I think they still have. You still yeah. do that? Yeah, actually, I think if, well, if they... Wait, don't you have a picture of yourself? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you gonna show that? Yeah, yeah, you guys can throw up the next photo. Right. See if they got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this was, this was the uh, last Halloween. So this was the, the, the uh, executive committee, and we, <laughs> we dressed up and went around the campus. And now we have to, we, we had some cars to help us because the campus is quite large, so we went around and, and, and uh, handed out candy to, to I, folks I all I can't the tell which one is you, Bill. Well, let's just keep it that way. No, no, no. You've got to tell uh, us. Give let's us see. A I'm, I'm wearing the uh, the orange uh, leisure suit and the the, the dark hair. Uh, so, yeah, very nice. Yeah, yeah. very nice. So, Do you but, have uh, other occasions to wear that suit? Uh, no. Yeah. No. No. But the, <laughs> so, you know, you say, well, what's the point of this? I, I mean, I think one of the elements is that, um, especially as companies get larger and not everybody knows everyone, there can be this tendency for people to think of the leaders as some special category or you know, uh, some different kind of human beings, and, and which is rubbish. And one of the th ways you break that is you just you have to be silly sometimes and just show that, hey, we're not, we're not special. Yeah. We, we have a duty to do our jobs, but we're not better than anyone. How, how do you pick the right people? I, I know how Herb did it. He was looking for the best scientists in his area. It wasn't that big an area at the time. How do you, how do you make sure you have the right people built for the, the culture, to maintain the culture you have now? Do you have a, do they come to you or do you go out and find them? Do you have a set of questions you ask that sort of determine whether they're gonna be a good fit? I, I think if, if you have a strong enough culture, it sorts itself out pretty well. You don't have to go and do a lot of screening because people will, will come and say, hey, I wanna, I wanna work there. Um, if you say, hey, this is a mission orientation, we, we have sort of three pillars we talk about following the science, which yep. means we're not shooting from the hip, we, we're evidence-based, um, we do what's best for patients in every yep. case, and we create a great place to work, which means you treat all your colleagues with respect and, and we work to make sure that everyone feels welcome and like this is this is my company, you know, that everyone can yeah. say that, and uh, and and you explain that to folks, and people either warm up to that and say, wow, that's I, I want to be there, that's great, and most people do, by the way. I think most people want a, a company like that. Um, a few, occasionally, you have an opportunist, somebody who it's really, it's really all about them. That doesn't yeah. work, you know. They'll they'll wash out if they if they make it through the interview process, they won't last, because that that doesn't work in our, in our culture. But other than that, I, I think. We, we can have all kinds of people. So you've got a big group of people here that are hoping to have some clear takeaways from these sessions this morning. What would be your best advice, both of you, based on your experiences, best advice to them on building a great well, workforce? Well, uh, in terms of hiring the best people, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, and at almost 20 years ago, we reached a point in the com company where we had to get a new CEO overnight, essentially. And I think f that the board was involved in this and we were always concerned about succession in the company. And management usually doesn't like to discuss, all the boards that I've been on, succession is- Least favorite topic least favorite of management. Least favorite topic, yes. yes. <laughs> and, but we, we have, you have a sense. One thing that's important is for the, the board, who is important in the CEO uh, decision to who to hire and so on is to have uh, a, a, a sound knowledge of people down through the company at different levels. And you can make your own assessments of it. You, know, you can't always rely on a consulting firm to bring in the best guy. You have to make the decision. But when we were in the position that we had to have a CEO and quick, because a lot of things were happening, science and why, so on. Um, the thing for me 
at uh, that time was integrity. And um, we had a young man, a scientist, it turns out it turned out to be uh, just terrific CEO, Art Levinson, ran, uh, directed the company for years in the right direction. And Art had integrity, we all knew that. We all knew he was very bright. But we also knew that everyone in the company, uh, I say that uh, with meaning, everybody that I knew thought Art was a straight shooter. Hmm. Art would tell you if you were wrong, if you were right, uh, how can I help you? And he was the type of guy that would stay up all night and answer all the emails he got during the day. Wow. And so I think the, the important thing is to have um, people in, in your company at all levels, running groups and whatever. Integrity is the important thing. And you have to be willing to say, you're not quite right for your job, we're gonna let you go, but here's what I'll do to help hmm. you. That's part of the integrity I'm talking about. And then also identifying people who are the rising stars and are going to rise to yeah. the top. Bill, one last piece of advice for the group. Yeah, I'd, I'd say keep it simple. It's, it comes down to, uh, if you wanna build a great company, Make sure you have a great mission. That's, that's got to be the centerpiece of a great company. You can't make a mission. You, you, it, it's it's got to be there. It's the core. And then you just set yourself as a leader to every day, how do I ensure that everyone in my company is able to make progress towards that mission each day? That's it. If you do that, everything else sort of takes care of itself. Thank you both. Fascinating story. Great company. Really great to have you here with us.